Keiichi Tsuchiya drifts using six different drift techniques. Saiba. Shift lock. Breaking. Paint on. Axel off. In this issue of BMI's Special Edition, we will focus on the art of drifting performed by the Drift King himself, Keiichi Tsuchiya. We'll go through all six basic techniques essential to drifting and further analyze how Suchia is using these techniques from various camera angles. Let us guide you to the world of the Drift Kings Drift Bible. First of all, we'll take a look at how a drift machine should be tuned and modified. Looking at this S14 Sylvia with limited modifications to only the suspension area, you can say that drifting is not about power. Going sideways, relying on only brute power, is not what Tsuchiya aims for. So how should a beginner set up his or her machine to drift like the king? Okay, so what's the least amount of tuning you need to drift? We had lots of stuff done to our car right here, but you don't need to go all crazy to start drifting. First of all, you have to start with the suspension. Then you should also change the brake pads and brake fluid, but that's about it. And if you're lucky enough to be able to spend some more, upgrading the CPU, exhaust system, seats, steering and shift knob may be a good idea. And as you improve, maybe changing LSDs might be good in the future. Anyway, what I want you all to understand is that you don't need loads of money to enjoy the sport of drifting. Let's check out the six basic techniques that Tsuchiya actually applies to drift. See how Tsuchiya triggers the tail to slide with each move. To make it easier to analyze each drifting procedure at low speeds, we'll use the second hairpin at a Bisu circuit going counterclockwise. To begin with, I'll show you what I was doing back in the days long before anyone recognized me. This should be the entry-level technique for all novice drifters. <laughs> First of all, I cut the spring shorter on my car. And then you go out and turn your car sideways. There's no difficult weight transition involved here. We'll first use the e-brake to go sideways. And then we'll try what's called the shift lock, and then on to the power drift. That doesn't require much skill. I'll show you these three techniques. This one's for all beginners. Everyone goes through this stage. I started off doing this too. This drifting relies all on the e-brake. Straight away, brake, toe, and e-brake. Right there. Just like this. Well, it all starts from something like this. Don't worry about how you exit the corner. Just try to pull the e-brake at the corner entrance and concentrate on making the car go sideways. You brake and then turn the wheel, step on the clutch, and pull the e-brake. Release the e-brake, go into counter-steer mode, then wait. Wait until you know that the car is facing the corner exit direction. Then you gently start stepping on the gas. How hard you should step on the gas pedal should depend on how much you're sliding and counter-steering. All of this should get you to exit the corner in one piece. One must learn the timing and the rhythm of the Drift King's drifting procedure and actually feel the exact moment the tail slides in order to master the six basic drifting techniques. The length of the tail slide depends on the steering angle plus how long and how strong the e-brake is being pulled. All maneuvers must be done smoothly and timely, and to do that, having the right driving position becomes crucial. This is a must in order to give a car a quick counter-steer and respond to the car's slightest movement. Let's check out how Suchi is controlling the gas pedal from the outside. You can see he's controlling the drift without opening the gas all the way. The timing to pull the e-brake is almost synchronized with when the brakes are let off.
The second technique is the shift lock. Notice that Tsuchiya's right foot is not doing the heel and toe move. Okay, let's now look at the shift lock. I used to do this on snow and wet surfaces. I don't recommend to do this on dry roads, but here we go. Just like that. Kick the gas all the way in third gear. Brake, steer, then boom. You let the clutch go without using heel and toe. The rear will suddenly lock. Then you slide, counter steer from here. Rest is the same as a side brake drift. The corner entry procedure is the same as the side brake drift. The important point here is when to release the clutch. Tsuchiya lets off the clutch just as he eases off the brake and steers in. His braking only lasts for two seconds. It's like brake, brake, gas. The tail slide occurs right as he steers into the corner. This is how the car starts drifting from the corner entrance. In power over drifts, throttle control is the key. I used to do this when I couldn't drift yet. I'd brake like this and try to drift, but I couldn't because I was too scared. So the only thing I could do was to step on the gas all the way at the corner exit. I used to practice this on the snow as well. When you can't do anything about the strong understeer at the corner entry, you should try this on snow or on a wet surface to practice. Steer into the corner even if you feel the understeer. And at the corner exit, just floor the gas and make your car go sideways. And as you exit, counter steer. This should be the easiest way to drift at the entry level rather than side brake drifting and shift lock drifting. You should practice this on a slippery surface and remember not to step on the gas until you've reached the corner exit point. Because <laughs> if you give too much gas before this clipping point, you'll end up understeering. In this case, the corner entry is the same as before, gradually opening up the gas until the clipping point. Then Tsuchiya loosens up the gas for a moment and then he kicks in the gas pedal to get the tail sliding. Power over drifting needs strong front tire grip. This is the reason why Tsuchiya loosens the gas to make the weight shift to the front. By this time, you've mastered the entry level drifting. And if you're in control of the car's weight transition, you can pull your e brake lightly. Just a tad so that people watching can't even tell you're pulling the e brake. Then you'll learn how to drift using shift lock and braking. But this entry level is a good starting point for all beginners. How is the weight transition being done? Let's check out the braking drift. The three important things here are when to steer in, when to shift down, and how long you keep braking. These are the three most important factors. Okay, I'm in third gear, I'm stepping on it, I'm speeding, then brake. How much you brake is crucial. If you kill the speed too much, you'll end up stopping before you drift like this and with understeer. So you'll need a fair amount of speed even when you begin braking. Slow down to about 70% on the straightaway, then let go. Let go of the brake and steer into the corner. Here, you're a little over speeding. If you brake through the corner, you'll end up with understeer. So first brake and then turn, heel and toe and steer in towards the clipping point. You'll be over speeding here as well. Then you shift down to second gear while leaving your foot on the brake. Uh, let's say you're running around 5,500 revs when you shift down to second gear. Release the clutch like you're running around 5,400 revs, but don't let the gears lock. It's similar to shift lock drifting, but you don't lock the rear tires with braking drift. Anyhow, that's how I do it. Sometimes I drift by only braking, like through corners where I can enter and exit in second gear. I step on the brakes, leave the brakes on, then turn and I brake once again towards the clipping point. Then the car starts to slide. With this kind of drifting, I concentrate on the front and rear brake balance. If only the front brakes work and the rear don't, it's impossible to brake drift. 
you can't control the shifting weight of the car if only the front brakes work. Obviously, braking is the key here. Suchia is not braking hard at all. He's stepping on the brake with a certain rhythm to adjust the speed. If you coordinate the steering work to the braking, you're a step closer to Suchia's braking drift. Remember the rhythm of your right foot should be brake, 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 gas. Steering into the corner and shifting down should be done simultaneously. Next up is the fake drift, where you create large weight transition by force. When weight transition is difficult to make just by braking, you shift the weight with a faint movement. Quickly steer like this, and at this point, my foot is off the gas. And when I juke the car like this, the car bounces back with the weight, and that's when I step on the gas pedal. It's just like a pendulum, and you use that return force to make the weight transition. Here, too, I've stepped on the gas all the way for a second before I let go in order to get the car to slide. Once the car is in sliding mode, release the foot from the gas and control. I used to do this a lot in snow. If you're going too slow, you have to step on the gas to make it happen. But if you're going fast enough and you steer to the left and quickly steer back to the right, your tail will automatically start to slide. But you know, I wasn't that good back then, so my car would lose speed while I was doing all that. That's when I learned to give the car some gas to make the car slide, so that I can drift, even at such speeds. Because of the inertial force from the faint action, the braking doesn't have to be as strong as the braking drift. It's all physics and dynamics, but the rhythm of the right foot is always the same. Try this dynamic drifting? This one's pretty difficult, so even professional racing drivers like us can't always get it right. Drifting begins from stepping off the gas, just like the Fuji Speedway's 100R or the final corner at Suga. It's so tempting to break. Here in Ebisu, this 100R corner is a third gear corner. You step on the gas all the way in third gear. And the difficult part is where you release your foot from the gas pedal for a second. But you're coming in with enough speed in third gear. Steer into the corner and the moment you release the gas, you start to slide. On this particular track, you need to get ready for the final corner at this point and slow down. But for now, we'll ignore that to show you guys this dynamic drifting. So when you release the gas, your tail will slide. Then you just counter steer and control. I use this a lot at the Fuji Speedway's 100 arm corner. I charge in without braking and just instantly let go of the gas. And when the tail starts to drift, I just counter steer and slam on the gas as I exit the corner. You do this at the final corner at Tsugo. There are some cars that can plunge into the corner without braking at all. In a Miata, you can dynamic drift in Maze, go right in at full speed, and by releasing the throttle, you can initiate the tail slide. From there, it's just counter steering and stepping on the gas again at the exit. And that's what I call the dynamic drifting. This is an example of not how he stepped off the gas, but how Suchia was able to avoid crashing. His lightning quick steering work is simply unbelievable. So that was dynamic drifting, which is the ultimate form of all drifting. That wraps up the six basic techniques of drifting. 
I won't recommend the dynamic drifting at the early stages of learning how to drift, since it can be dangerous. With the mastering of all these six basic techniques, you too will be able to drift like a pro. The first thing you have to do if you want to take up drifting is not to be afraid. Try to have fun, and don't think too much about weight transition, dynamic drifting, and your suspension setup. Visit a track, go out there, and start pulling the e-brake. That's the best way to learn how to drift. After you get the hang of it, try to use all six techniques in various corners. Take your car to as many tracks as possible and try different styles of drift. And again, be safe and have fun. The art of Tsuchiya's drifting is that no matter which track it is, or what car he's driving, he can drift beautifully. Why is this possible? Let's see why Tsuchiya is called the Drift King at Mazze Circuit. Maze Circuit in Niigata Prefecture. I hope you understood the basic techniques that I showed you at Ebisu. Here at Maze, we're going to be applying those basic techniques to high-level drifting. As you can see from the track layout, Maze Circuit is composed of many types of corners, from low to mid-speed corners to high-speed corners, where I can show you the e-brake drifting, power over drifting, and dynamic drifting. <laughs> well, the dynamic is too dangerous here, so we'll try a combination of the brake drifting and dynamic. And we'll show you how to do this with various types of cars, actual cars that you might own. I'll show you how to drift with cars that won't turn well, or have strong oversteer, or even cars with very little power. Here is a demo run by Suchia in a nicely tuned S14 Sylvia. I have to warm up my tires first. This slightly wet condition can make the car oversteer or understeer in certain corners. So, let's warm up the tires and the brakes first. How will Suchia control his S14 on this surface? The G-ball will indicate the weight transition at each corner. It's wet here, so I'll just pull the e-brake to avoid the understeer. For the first couple of laps, I'll demonstrate the braking drift with this K-Office S14. This S14 is modified with a great suspension system that allows the car to perform high-speed drifting. I should be able to clear all corners with the braking drift. You know, no matter which track you're at, which corner you're going through, what you have to do is basically the same. It doesn't matter if you're in Ebesu or Maze. It's the same thing. Braking drift is controlled by the braking power. Your braking touch. Oh, it's wet here, so I should take it easy. According to the length of each corner, you need to adjust the force of your braking. I went into that corner too fast. It's, it's all wet here. See? I'm doing the same thing. No matter where I go, this is how I do it. But remember, you have to adjust your speed, braking power, and steering angle for each corner. What do you do when it's all wet like this? Just pull the old e-brake.
In corners where understeer is strong, just pull the e-brake. It's best not to use it too much, but you can do it when you're still learning. Oops, uh, that was understeering right there. Uh, here again. <laughs> began as a braking drift, but towards the exit, I switched to dynamic drifting. Here, I'm power drifting at the exit. This is how I do it. That's almost like dynamic, because I only touch the brakes just a bit. It's a combination of braking and dynamic. Brake and shift down to second. Ride the brakes a little, then transfer the weight to the front. And from here, it's power drifting. I'm going uphill here, so I'll give it a little more braking so that I can get a stronger weight shift and leave a little braking here as well. curves the think drift should be used. like this. Anyway, like I said, what you do is the same no matter where you go. In braking drifts, just remember to leave that foot on the brake until the weight starts to shift, synchronizing it with your downshifting to third and to second gear. The car will automatically turn in, and then the car will either lose front grip or lose traction in the rear. You let the rear lose grip by adjusting the brake pedal. Let's check out how the S14 is acting on this final corner from the outside camera. This well-balanced S14 Sylvia goes into braking drift by a light touch of braking and smooth steering work. This time, let's check the onboard footage from another lap. Look at the braking. Just like at Ebisu Circuit, Suchi is getting the tail to slide by pumping lightly on the brake. As Suchi counter steers, the G balls are intact and moving towards the rear very smoothly. A beautiful drift must have smooth weight transition. Pay attention to the angle of his counter steering and throttle control. Okay, like I said, 
There are cars that don't turn well, resulting in strong understeering. Here we have the Hachiroku and the S13, both which are notorious for understeering and weak front traction. If the car is this low, I don't think the suspension has enough travel. Anyway, even with cars like this, you can get them to go sideways. But how? Well, let's try it out. What do you do if you think there's going to be understeer? Remember, pull the e-brake. After braking, and if the weight doesn't shift enough, what do you do? Pull the e-brake. Then you turn just like this. It's the same here too. If the weight won't shift, e-brake it. It's the same at the next corner as well. No weight shifting, then pull the e-brake. And this time, use the brake pedal to turn back. That wasn't so hard, right? No. I'm standing here at the first hairpin curve on the Maze circuit. I'd like to demonstrate the different drifting procedures with different cars. The S14 Sylvia has good front grip and a good weight up front, which enables the car to turn easily. All I had to do was create and control the weight transition with my braking. In contrast, the S13's front grip is terrible. Yes, like your car, probably. If you install one of K-Office suspensions, it will go away, but I'm not here to advertise my product, so let's move on. Okay, you start. This is the first corner. You're climbing up to around here, and understeer is strong going uphill. And with the S14, I could easily turn into the corner with a little steering work, and by riding the brakes a little. The S13 and the Hachiroku won't turn enough because it needs more front end weight. So what do I do? I give it stronger braking in order to create stronger weight shift to the front. Actually, the braking I do here is the equivalent to how long and strong I brake with the e-brake. Remember, always to shift more weight towards the front end. So here you're going uphill. And when you reach the top, you start braking. And as you turn into the corner, ride the brakes longer compared to what you would do on an S14. Then the rear end will start to slide. From here, you just smile and step on the gas to power drift right out from the corner. Next up is a champion of oversteering, the MR2. I mean, these types of cars won't stop once it starts going around. Just like the NSX, these mid-engine layout cars have light front ends and heavier rears, which makes them spin happy. Oof, that was close. When I ride the brakes like I did with the S14, this happens. Adjusting the pressure you brake with and how long you brake entering the corner is the key here. The difference between the S14 and the MR2 is the braking power you apply. The braking time I ride into the corner is only about half of what I did with the S14. Right here, I quit braking already. And the braking pressure itself will be weaker compared to the S14. Of course, the method to decrease speed is exactly the same. But here, you leave the brakes on. That's the difference. Here, you begin your counter steer a, a bit earlier. That's how you keep control and drift with understeer.
Oops. Yeah, I thought I had that one. Well, but hey, even monkeys fall from trees. The car had too much speed on that one. So, the important thing here is to keep the weight transition small. Delicate weight shifting is the key here. Like here. I go in like this. But I'll let go of my brakes early. You can tell by looking at the G-Ball that the weight transition is smoother compared to the S14. This is how you drift with cars that have strong oversteer. You countersteer as soon as the tail slides. Earlier countersteer is important. And the speed, you have to start countersteering at high speeds like this. That's how you drift with oversteer cars like the MR2. The difference between the cars I've shown today is like this. The S13, the car with strong understeer, needs big weight shifting. The S14, which has neutral steer, only needs braking drift technique to go into the corner smoothly. Whereas strong oversteer cars, like the MR2, need stability as you brake into the corner. You're carrying a heavy load of weight in the rear that makes the car unstable and wobbly when you're going in. So, stabilize the rear weight and go into the corner, adjusting the amount of your braking according to the steering angle. The amount of weight transition is about half of what you have with an S14. And with only half the pressure on the brakes, these cars can turn in at the same angle as the S14. The S14's countersteer is sharp compared to that of the MR2. So what must be done on the MR2 is the exact opposite. When you steer in, let off the brakes early. The tail end will react and start to slide. Then you countersteer. On the S14, I countersteer at this rate. But on the MR2, I steer like this and wham. That's the kind of difference in steering speed. But the important thing here is the speed of your countersteer. Not just here on the first hairpin, but here on the S-curve. And right here as well. When going downhill, the weight becomes larger, so the rear becomes easier to get thrown out. So it's better to turn small here on the first one, so that you can drift on the second corner. The same here. You don't want any understeer or get thrown towards the outside on the first one, as these cars with strong oversteer won't be able to recover by the second corner that's coming right up. So, just turn small on the first one, and on the second one, just lightly step on the brakes or let go of the gas to get the momentum change. Then you can control with a quick counter steer. Compared to FR cars, these mid-engine cars have good traction. Therefore, the driver has to act quickly and perform the next move earlier. You can wait for the tail slide to ease down a bit before you hit the gas on FR cars. But on these mid-engine cars, you don't wait. But you hit the gas while the car is still sliding. You have to get the car to power slide immediately. And without stopping the tail slide you're in during the midsection of the corner. Everything has to be done earlier on mid-engine cars compared to FR machines. Mid-engine cars, like the MR2, have heavier loads towards the rear compared to FR cars. So mid-engine cars tend to have a stronger grip with the rear tires. Hitting the gas early makes the rear tires lose traction, which enables the car to slide and drift. The big difference between the S13 and the S14 is that the action needed to trigger the tail slide is smaller. You don't need big braking maneuvers or steering work to slide the tail and drift.
further, by checking the different laps, you can see Suchia stepping on the brakes with more pressure, but the tail doesn't slide. So he gives it gas, but even that doesn't make the car slide. The last thing he did was letting off the gas to get the car to go sideways. This proves how Suchia can instantly change his applied techniques according to the situation he is facing. Okay. Now, how do you drift a car that doesn't have much power? What I'll be explaining to you here is from way back when I used to drive the Hachiroku every day and night. And that's like 15 years ago. With this car, it's all about flooring the gas pedal all the way from the entrance to the exit. This car's been nicely lowered as well. Mine used to look like this. You have to step on it to make this thing go sideways. With these underpowered cars, you just have to keep the gas on to get it into power drift mode. <laughs> I just killed the power. But it's great that I can constantly floor this thing. This is great. I'm flooring it. It's so cool. I wish Toyota could make cars like this again. Shift down and put the pedal to the metal. It feels great. Just the right amount of power to have fun. This kind of power is just right for these M7 tires. Feels good. Now, this is fun. flooring it the entire way. Do you know any other car that can do this? It's just great. What I'm doing is simply turning the car with the gas pedal. Step on the gas to make it turn, brake, and shift down, then step on the gas again. A step on it to let the rear go. You have to keep revving it within the torque band. Oops, I dropped it. Whoops. The instant you fall out of the torque band, you stop drifting. So make sure you rev it up enough to keep it up there. This is what I mean. So, how was drifting with an underpowered Hachiroku? This car is a classic, and it will be a classic for years to come. Did you know I taught Takumi from Initial D how to drift in one of these? Okay, the first hairpin, what am I doing? I'm simply turning the car only with the gas pedal. This is the biggest difference from other cars. This is quite a technique, definitely for advanced drifters. You need to use this here on the first hairpin, and here, and here on the S-turn. And here. I use a combination of the braking drift and dynamic drift. It's the same here as well, but on the final corner, these old cars have tendencies to understeer. So, what do you do? You step on the gas and turn the car sideways. Let's check the steering work for the first corner. You come down the straightaway in third gear. So, shift down to second. Steer into the corner. But the car is understeering. 
step on the gas all the way and let the rear slide. Then you let go of the gas and wait. But if you wait too long, you'll lose too much rev and your drift power will stall. So, after you give it gas all the way to make the tail slide, counter steer. And as you do this, place your foot on the gas, just to keep the rev within the torque band. This is how you drift right from the corner entrance to the exit. And this is also the reason why an underpowered classic like the Hajiroku can go up against the high-tech power machines of today. I'm turning using the gas pedal at all corners. You know, you may be able to drift in other cars, but drifting through the corners from entrance to exit in an underpowered car is a tough task to pull off. And that's why people who say they can drift in a Skyline, a Supra, MR2, or a Silvia can't always go sideways in a Hachiroku. This is because you really need to know your stuff to keep the underpowered car drifting through corners. And to get this done, you must master the six basic techniques to make your drift perfect. Let's check the Hachiroku on the final corner. In this corner, a standard braking and shift lock triggers the car to drift. But the throttle control from here is different. Tsuchiya floors it immediately to keep the car sliding all the way from the entrance to the corner exit. He's purposely letting the wheel spin a bit so he can control the tail slide with little power. He's driving while constantly maintaining loose traction. These six techniques and their various application make the Drift King go sideways. How did I become the Drift King? I can only say that I was driving day and night. I guess people call it practicing and hard work. But to me, I was just having fun out there. To enjoy driving, or shall we say practice, for now, all you need is some safe, clear space. This will be enough. Let's start with a 180 degree turn. The first thing I tried right after I got my driver's license is this. Pull the e-brake and try to end up facing the direction I came from. In my days, it was cool to be able to do this and get it right. You know, you guys have these cones or pylons now, but in my days, we didn't have anything like that, nor were we smart enough to think of using one. If I had these cones back then, I would have improved much faster. Obviously, in the beginning, I couldn't get it right like this. It used to be like this. I was scared and didn't know how fast I should be going, so I would stop like this. But turning the car in the direction that you came from without stopping the engine means that the driver is stepping on the clutch to turn the car around. In the beginning, it's okay to mess up and stop facing the wrong direction or even stall the engine. But don't get scared. Just try it in a safe, closed environment. And once you learn how to turn 180 degrees with an e-brake, your next step should be making 90-degree turns. I never did this on the streets. The important thing is to keep trying and, of course, practice in a safe place. Turning 90 degrees is a cool trick. Let's say this is a right-angle corner and you go like this. This 90 degree turn is easy once you get the hang of pulling the e-brake, adjusting your speed and counter steering to face the right direction. Once you master these two techniques, you'll want to install an LSD. You'll be able to turn 180 degrees and move on to doing 360s without stalling the engine. But remember, this is after you've completed the 90 and 180 degree turns. Believe me, you will be able to do this only if you know the basic techniques of sliding the car from a simple tail slide to a power slide, adjusting the drifting with your gas pedal. The LSD really comes after you master the basic techniques. The important thing here is to discover how much fun it is to play with your car. Like here, I can turn just by pulling the e-brake. When you learn to do this correctly, you'll want to do it on the track. The main objective of this special training program is that you have fun driving your car. 
If you have fun, you'll be calm enough to sense the behavior of your car, and at the same time, you won't be scared of your tail sliding anymore. Suchia says that if you go through these training programs, you'll be able to drift on track for sure. Watching this DVD should enable you to look over the weak points of your driving, and from there, try out the various drifting techniques that Suchia has illustrated. The lesson continues. Special training program number four is learning how to use the handbrake according to the radius of the corner. Okay, first of all, okay, here, how about this? See, I counter-steered and stopped the car facing the direction I want to exit. You have to counter-steer toward the exit direction. You can see here that I am actually counter-steering. And it's okay to pull the e-brake and stop here. Beginners tend to end up facing the wrong direction, like this. So, controlling the car towards the direction that you want to go is crucial here. You can do this by adjusting how long you actually pull the e-brake. I was supposed to go that way, but I was pulling the e-brake too long. But let's face it, you'll mess up at the beginning, so learn from your mistakes and don't smash up your car and pay for repairs all the time like I did. You guys have places like this, Driftland. I think it's important to practice without worrying about your repair fees or putting someone else in danger. See, here. I'm pulling the e-brake too long, letting the car slide too much. In this situation, your left hand is pulling the e-brake, and your right hand working the counter-steer is too slow. This is how you'll end up facing the direction that you came from. So, just shorten the time you're pulling the e-brake. This is what happens when you steer too much. This was a good example. As you just saw, I began counter-steering too late, and then I recovered the counter-steer too late. As a result, my car just lost control. If all my steering work was done earlier, I could have avoided this. If you end up doing this, just hit the brakes and stop the car. Take a deep breath and calm down. You won't get anywhere trying to recover from this state, so just stop the car and chill, okay? And start from zero all over again. Okay, let's review the training program. I admit that this training needs effort, but you want to have fun, too. So find a safe place to practice and start from the 180-degree turn. Then try the 360, but you need an LSD to do this. Then the 90-degree turn. And when you learn all this, come to a track like this one to practice, where you can find something like this. To practice doing donuts, you need an LSD. Come to a track like this to practice pulling the e-brake along the actual radius of the corner. If it's a 90-degree corner, just pull the e-brake for a second, counter-steer, and then hit the gas. For 180, which actually is a U-turn, you need to keep pulling for at least one second to let the tail slide. So practice and learn to get the feeling of what kind of speed, angle, and steering work is needed for various turns. I said practice, but you'll have so much fun, you won't feel like you're practicing at all. You'll have a lot of fun, I can guarantee that. Until you can do all of this with your eyes closed, you'll be spending a lot of your pocket money on tires. You know, if you can't afford new tires, just get some nice ones for the front and go to a scrapyard for the rear tires. Used tires from a scrapyard can be put to good use on a drift machine. After you practice with used tires and become better at drifting, well, let's say you can counter-steer and kick the gas in towards the corner exit and drift properly once every three times. You're now ready to get some good tires on all four wheels. At this point, you should be wearing the same tires in the front and the back. With new tires, you're dealing with real grip. And here, maintenance is very important. If you are like me, and you love cars, you have to take good care of them. 
Right? If you practice like this, with your e-brake all the way up here, if you leave it, you're out. Your e-brake should at least be like this. Sometimes there are guys going like this. I mean, you're not driving a train for crying out loud. So please, use some sense to maintain your car. I used to adjust my e-brakes once a month. Back then, the e-brake was all I had. At one time, I couldn't turn without it. I'm serious. And brake balance is also important. Racing cars have brake balance adjusters, but production cars don't. So we have to adjust brakes by changing the brake pads. Beginners tend to think that just changing the front pads can make some difference. But what a big mistake. It will make some changes, but it just messes up your balance. For instance, my front pads are Image C2, but if the rear pads were stock, only the front pads will work and mess up the balance. But again, there are preferences according to the driver. So another important thing is, don't just imitate the pros and simply install pads. You need to find the ones that suit your driving style. I like the linear feeling, but you might prefer ones that need hard braking to get it working, like the Super Sports brake pads. So, choose the right pads depending on your style and the front tire grip. Doing nothing to the rear won't get you anywhere. I assure you, you'll have a hard time in the corners. Say you're in a braking drift, and beginners often pull the e-brake, right? In that case, you need a decent pair of rear brake pads to get the rear tires to lock by pulling the e-brake. Plus, if you're wearing poor grip tires on the rear, it's easier to lock them with decent rear pads. When you become an intermediate drifter, you can now step on the gas when you're tail sliding, right? If you drift for five days a week like I used to, you need to overhaul your LSD once every month or so. This means if you go drifting once a week, you'd need an LSD overhaul at least once every eight months or so. An LSD that needs an overhaul feels like a viscous LSD, and it's not fun at all. The car won't exit properly and sometimes kills the drifting. You only end up with worn out rear tires because the inner wheels keep spinning. It just ruins the fun of drifting. So make sure to overhaul your LSD and maintain your drift machine in healthy condition. You will have more fun on a well-maintained drift machine. The Drift King. Suchir says, I still want to get better. This is Suchia's flat-out drift attack at every shoe circuit. show, then you're ready for the ultimate drifting style, the high-speed drift. The six techniques are still vital for this style of drifting, but now you're going fast. When speed and drift meet, you get the ultimate driving style. The high-speed drift is composed from small counter steering and velocity.
High speed drift needs braking delayed to the absolute limit, instant steering work, and all out cornering exit skills. Every movement needs to be orchestrated precisely. Focus on the steering work as well. In high speed drifts, tail sliding is controlled and limited, so counter steering work can be minimized. Wheel spins are limited also, making the car easier to grip and accelerate at the corner exit. Let's compare the high speed drift and the show drift laps at Ebisu. Show drift keeps drifting from the entrance to the exit. High speed drifting, traction recovery is very quick, even during the counter steering work. The steering angle is kept at a minimum as well. So, how did you like the VMI Special Edition Drift Bible? I hope I was able to show you the profound world of drifting. It's a driving technique and also a sport in its own category. But when I first started drifting, I was having a ball just going sideways. But some people used to criticize my driving style, say that it wasn't real drifting, because I was using the e-brake and shift locks. But I didn't care, and I just kept at it. And at the same time, having a great time. As I've been saying all through this DVD, the six basic techniques are what make my drifting style possible. After mastering all six techniques, I found the dynamic drifting. To be specific, it's a combination of the braking drift and dynamic drift. This style naturally became my own drifting style. Anyway, don't ever give up, even if your car is not turning or has strong oversteer. There's always a way to drift any car. And remember to be safe and have fun. Try to have as much fun as possible when you start drifting. And once you're able to drift, set your goals higher and keep at it. Aim to become the next Drift King.